If you ever review a trust or draft a trust, you may be familiar with a clause that requires trustees to report possibly annually to the trust beneficiaries. Things like an inventory, an accounting of trust income, and even other documents relating to the trust and reports relating thereto. Increasingly, trustees are pushing back on this requirement. So the question is, is that required in a trust? Now, under the Uniform Trust Code, that duty has been standardized, but has also been relaxed. In some cases, the trust can waive it, but the trust can never waive a beneficiary's basic right to at least receive information after a reasonable request. Similarly, a trustee can request that a beneficiary waive this, um, this reporting obligation, but the beneficiary is typically free to terminate that waiver at will, and beneficiaries should technically be advised before doing so. Now, we're going to talk about uniform rules, but state law considerations can change this duty and waivability of the duty, and even the settlor's intent if there's a silent trust, for example, could change the considerations as well. I'm Griffin Bridgers, and this is 10 Minutes with Griffin. For today's episode, episode 198, we're really just going to get into the basics of a trustee's accounting and reporting duties. Now, I, I emphasize basics because what we're going to find is there's a lot, a lot of gray area to this. Um, there are so many considerations that go into the facts and circumstances and when and if it's a good idea to have the trust document or a beneficiary waive these reporting obligations. So there's no hard and fast rule and this uh, presentation may leave you with more questions than it does answers. But we're going to at least look at what the Uniform Trust Code, which has been adopted in a number of states, says on this duty. Now, as always, this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice. It is provided for educational purposes only. And if you'd like a copy of these slides, please email me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. Now on to the presentation. So, in many trust agreements, there's a duty imposed on the trustee to provide periodic reports and accountings to beneficiaries. Sometimes it's quarterly, annually, could even be monthly, depending on that frequency, that's usually the part that's pushed back on by trustees because that can be burdensome to annually account to the beneficiaries, especially for highly illiquid assets, hard to value assets, or trusts where just nothing goes on. But there is an opposing viewpoint here where it's a good idea to have this if you're the beneficiary because it creates checks and balances on the trustee. If the beneficiary knows what's going on, they have the room to ask the right questions and see if the trustee is the right fit for the trust itself or for the beneficiary. And within that, there may be some opportunity to look at getting the right person in place or the right institution in place uh, on a bifurcated trustee um, situation or arrangement, or even in a co-trustee type of arrangement. Now, traditionally, you've found this in all trusts, but the Uniform Trust Code, um, which varies by state, does allow these duties to be relaxed, depending on which state you might be in and which state um, governs the administration of the trust. Now, the basic duty is found in UTC Section 813. So there's a default duty where there's a, an annual reporting requirement at the very least just to the income beneficiaries or to the beneficiaries who right now can receive principal or they have to get an annual report of accounting and inventory. Similarly, any other beneficiary who requests it, even if they're not a qualified beneficiary, must receive a copy of this accounting and inventory. Now, there's another duty which requires information to beneficiaries, such as a copy of the trust instrument, a notice of a change of trustee, or trustee acceptance or an irrevocability of the trust. Those are automatic and are more situation-based, and they're more request-based. 
But the big picture is, can you waive any of those duties uh, in the trust document or otherwise? And the answer is yes. We're going to start with um, the beneficiary themselves. The beneficiary can waive any of those duties on the trustee with a little bit of color added to that. One is that that waiver can be terminated at will by the beneficiary. So uh, there can be no contract or anything where the, where the trustee really locks in the beneficiary to sticking to that waiver for perpetuity. And it's important to note too that the UTC in general has a common overriding theme that says that beneficiaries cannot waive or indemnify any action that's taken by the trustee either in bad faith or with reckless indifference to the trust instrument. So that waiver, even if it's broad on paper, may have some limitations depending on the state and the trustee should know about that and ideally the beneficiary should know about that. Now beyond that the trust instrument itself can waive the reporting duty up to a point. So for example the requirement of frequency or you have to provide an annual report or anything on a mandatory basis without prompting by a beneficiary, that can be removed. So that automatic duty can be waived, but any sort of right of a beneficiary to request information about the trust itself cannot be waived. Now it can be limited to a certain extent. For example, um, if the trust instrument does waive this reporting duty, um, the trustee can limit the obligation to notify beneficiaries to just those who've reached age 25 when it comes to certain automatic information requirements such as an acceptance of trusteeship or determining when the trust becomes irrevocable or is irrevocable with respect to a new addition to the trust. But beyond that, no beneficiary can waive their right to receive information about the trust itself. So the big question is whether and when should the duties be waived, whether in the trust instrument or by a beneficiary, especially when you run into a situation where a trustee for hire requests a waiver of this duty. So whether or not that's a good idea is going to depend on a number of facts and circumstances. So like I said, this is a highly gray area. There's really no hard and fast rule or rules, plural, that I can give you here. So I think if you're going to draft this in, in the beginning, it shouldn't just be a simple uh, request at the at the behest of the client or the trustee, I think the trust the drafting should take into account the effect of the waiver, maybe at certain inflection points in the life of the trust, and should account for the settlor's intent as well. So what do I mean by this? For example, while the settlor is alive, it may be a better idea to waive that than it might be after the settlor's death, just because the settlor themselves could be a check and balance in, an, uh, you know, to a certain extent. Now it's also important to note that the waiver of the duty should also be balanced with the ability to remove and replace a trustee because you don't want the beneficiaries to be able to remove somebody and put in a friend and then waive their right to uh, information and reporting just because that still affects the remainder beneficiaries of the trust. So when I say that you should balance this with settlor's intent, the big overriding theme is looking at what rights exist beyond just the beneficiary with respect to whom the waiver is being requested right now. So ideally, this is the worst outcome. You want to avoid a trustee who can become entrenched after obtaining a waiver because it makes it easier for that trustee to commit fraud uh, on behalf of the current beneficiary or even remaindermen within that trust itself as well. And depending on where the successor trustees are located, it's important to note too that the effectiveness of the waiver could be expanded or contracted based on a change of the situs in the trust itself. And beyond that, if you're a beneficiary, a lot of people kind of skirt over this. Um, you know, within a lot of trusts I've reviewed, I've seen in the trust packet copy of copies of prior beneficiary waivers that have been signed. So the big question is whether, as a beneficiary, uh, they should obtain guidance. And a lot of beneficiaries are reluctant to do so because, you know, to get, say, an independent attorney, they may have to pay out of pocket uh, for a review of the facts and circumstances uh, for that waiver.
Now, despite the terms of the waiver, it's important to note that uh, depending on the state, the beneficiary can't permanently waive their right to request information about the trust. So if there's a request that has a broad perpetual waiver of everything, that may be a red flag in and of itself. You either have a, a misinformed trustee or a trustee who's trying to pull one over. But contrast that with settlers intent again. Some states may permit silent trusts, so settlers' intent should be weighed as to whether it is a silent trust and to what extent can this duty be balanced with the silent trust obligation. So silent trusts you can only do in certain states that have relaxed the UTC enough beyond its um, common law drafting in order to, to get to that point. Another thing to consider is that virtual representation can be difficult. There's a waiver not just of, um, you know, by the beneficiary, but maybe by the beneficiary's minor children with that beneficiary who's waiving it, uh, doing so on their behalf. So that's something to consider in drafting as well. How can you ease that requirement with virtual representation? So mandatory reporting may not kick in until age 25 for minor beneficiaries. So that may be something to keep in mind when requesting a waiver as well, but also monitoring that there may be beneficiaries coming online who have their right to information ripen at age 25 and may be operating under a prior waiver and that now there's a new waiver they need to sign or reject or terminate depending on the circumstances. So lots of items to keep in mind. Um, long story short, the information and reporting obligations are waivable to a certain extent in the trust or by a beneficiary, but there's just so many permutations in terms of circumstances and even the state in which the trust is administered that you really need to be aware of and monitor the effect of that waiver on an ongoing basis. As always, if you have questions, not on client matters, but on this material, or if you have topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. And thank you for listening to this episode of 10 Minutes with Griffin, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.